Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Je m'appelle Mojane Bezadi uh, et j'utilise les pronoms elle et je suis responsable de la programmation um, et de la recherche à Artex. Uh, my name is Mojane Bezadi. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and uh, I am the programming and research coordinator at Artex. Um, avant de commencer, j'aimerais prendre un moment pour réfléchir collectivement avec vous et reconnaître les territoires sur lesquels nous habitons. Um, Artex est situé uh, en territoire autochtone non cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Ganyangehaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui de notre côté, uh, Jojage, Muniyang ou Montréal est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreux peuples autochtones et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect avec les liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons nos relations continues avec les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise et nous vous invitons à prendre position pour combattre le racisme et la discrimination systémique. L'équipe d'Artex offre ses condoléances et notre solidarité aux communautés autochtones à travers l'île de la Tortue. Um, euh, donc, la découverte récente des dépouilles de 215 enfants dans la communauté de Kamloops euh, Squapem euh, sur le site de l'ancien pensionnat autochtone de Kamloops en Colombie-Britannique nous a tous profondément attristés. Et cette dernière euh, nous confronte à notre passé colonialiste, pourtant présent et actif encore aujourd'hui euh, par les politiques coloniales et le racisme euh, systémique qui continue d'avoir des répercussions sur les communautés autochtones, nationales, locales. Euh, pour terminer, Artex se veut un espace communautaire, sécuritaire et amical. Aucune forme d'harcèlement ou de discrimination ne sera tolérée. Si une situation de la sorte se produit, s'il vous plaît, communiquez avec moi-même ou Annabelle Chassé, qui porte le nom de Centre d'information Artext. Et euh, <coughs> si nous avons euh, une situation qui nous forcerait de mettre fin à l'événement, euh, Annabelle partagera dans le chat. Euh, elle partagera dans le chat, je vais laisser quelques personnes rentrer, <rire> euh, le lien à un nouveau Zoom dans euh, l'événement Facebook qu'elle partagera également euh, en ce moment sur euh, le chat. Donc, um, hello everyone, welcome. Um, before we begin and before I introduce uh, Clara and Katie and this event, Um, I would like to introduce myself. As I said earlier, my name is Mojan Bezadi. I am the research coordinator and programs coordinator at Artex. Um, Artex uh, would like to begin by taking a moment to ask you to join us collectively in reflecting on the, ter on the ter territories on which we, you are joining us. Uh, we are located on unceded indigenous lands, Ganyangehaga. The Ganyangehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and water on which uh, our text is situated. Jojage Muniyang, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many indigenous nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connection with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community and invite you in joining us to become active accomplices uh, in an effort to end racism and systemic discrimination. In addition, the Artex team offers our condolences and our solidarity to the indigenous communities across Turtle Island following the recent discovery of remains of 215 children in the Kamloops Skorpayam community on the site of the former residential school uh, in Kamloops, which has brought great sadness um, to many communities. This recent news confronts us with our colonial past and our very present um, uh, colonial present, which is quite still active and uh, through colonialist uh, policies and systemic racism that continue to affect um, indigenous communities. 
To finish uh, and to begin this event, our text is a safe and friendly space. Um, and we uh, will not, um, no harassment or discrimination will be tolerated. And if such a situation were to occur, please contact uh, myself or my colleague Annabelle Chassé, who uh, has the name uh, Centre d'Information Art Text uh, in the chat, and uh, we will try to intervene. Uh, and if we need to terminate the event uh, because of uh, a situation of the sort, um, Annabelle Chassé is uh, sharing in the chat right now the link to our Facebook event where we'll, we will share a new uh, Zoom link. So with all this being said, uh, welcome to our two um, guests today, Clara Duplessis and Katie Salmon, who have been in residence at Artex throughout the spring and who have um, who have um, made a lot of research together. Um, Clara has been on site at Artex and Katie has been joining her uh, virtually from London um, in the UK, not London, Canada. And so they are going to share with us something very special uh, today. And so Clara Duplessis is a, a Montreal-based poet and literary curator. And Katie Salmon is a sculptor, photographer and moving image artist based in London, take it away. Insipid. Literally, here begins. Enclosed in apostrophe, commas, and parentheses, this snippet punctuated in an exclamatory passage, O oh, collaboration. Our citational practice is each other. Our infrastructure is the vast virtual distance between your ideas and mine, and yet, even a dead language speaks its mind. In the beginning, there is the event written in big letters at the beginning of each text, ornamentally inclined, an inkling of what's to come. Incipient script herded from the towering first word onto the pastoral page, co-creation of word and image, of word as image, this Magnus Opus. The scriptorium of my office, the studio of your home. By the time we share this poem, our here has become its hereafter.
Hi there. So what you've just watched is some of the work that Clara and I have produced over the last month and a half during our collaborative residency at Artex. We view this work as a sculptural poetic artist book. So at the start of the talk, you heard Clara uh, read the first poem of our project entitled Insipid, followed by a short video um, of the first sculpture of our book, also entitled Insipid. Unfortunately, uh, sharing the video via uh, Zoom has affected its quality, so I apologize for that. But we have put a link into the chat if you'd like to view it via Vimeo at its high quality um, and also uh, smoother. Uh, just to say also that um, we will be putting some links to other uh, videos um, on the chat, uh, which are um, some of the resources that we've, we've been um, working with in our text. Our initial uh, project title was Narrative of Process, Activating the Artist Book. Um, as we were interested in kind of narrativizing uh, the process and practice of our residency with the pared down gestures of Katie and myself um, as characters, of our text as location, and of our research um, as plot. <laughs> But we really became interested in activating uh, the artist book. And so the project we ended up working um, on over the past six weeks um, now has three main parts called Insipid, Scree, Explicit, um, and consists on my part um, of 20 new poems and on Katie's part of five new sculptures. Insipid and explicit are Latin words, which mean uh, the first and the final words of a handwritten manuscript. Uh, scree is obviously the kind of uh, mountainous fragmentation of pebbles on a steep surface. And so these three terms really uh, structure our work according to a beginning, a middle, and an ending, almost as if we were still working with this idea of narrative, um, at least according to how, you know, Aristotle <laughs> defines uh, narrative in his poetics. Okay, so the insipid sculpture, which you can see in a few of its uh, poses or configurations here, was made in direct conversation with Clara's poem, Insipid. While Insipid is one single poem, uh, the Insipid sculpture actually com is comprised of 42 different configurations, or as I call them, uh, poses. Um, each one of these poses um, uses uh, two or more of five uh, single components, which are scrunched or hand-molded uh, printouts of Clara's poem, and also an image of a pre-existing work of mine called Salt Scree, which you actually saw in the first slide alongside the insipid uh, poem. So scrunching and hand-molding the forms in this way obscures the contents of the uh, poems and the photographs, and they become instead an entanglement of limbs that also mimic the uh, grammatical uh, forms of language that uh, Clara uh, used in her poem Insipid, specifically uh, the brackets, uh, colons, and full stops. So when these five individual components are merged together in this way, they act as temporal gestures that are more weight, uh, weightless or fluid. Uh, they balance on top of one another and exist uh, in these uh, forms for only a few seconds. So sometimes uh, they exist for only as, as long as the camera shutter, um, which captures them in this constant state of flux and fragility. I imagined these uh, change in poses as a choreography of movement, as the viewer's eyes, neck, hands and brain navigate, hold and absorb the book. A shared dance um, is, is how I, I imagined it, actually. 
Um, but this idea of um, a choreography of movement is also um, discussed by Sharon Helgeson Gallagher in an essay of hers um, called What Shall We Want to um, Have Called a Book in The Book is Alive, which was one of many um, brilliant resources that we did find in, in the archives at Artex. But what I was really interested with in this essay is that um, Gallagher actually talks about what the physical essence of a book is and how the um, act of reading a physical book compares to the digital. So specifically, she, she talks um, actually less about what we might think is the essence of a physical book, which I always associated with smell, uh, memory or nostalgia but in fact about the choreography of movement of the body and the brain. So quote, from left to right, from right back to left, from spatial to temporal processing, from visual to verbal and back again, the thick temporal symmetries of the dance steps my brain takes as it progresses through the book. So in this way, um, we do hope that once the incipit, um, or once the whole book is, is exhibited or housed publicly, um, the viewer or the reader will be encouraged to um, rebuild as many of these 42 different poses as they like, and hopefully in a way experience uh, some of this choreography of movement themselves. So while Katie was making this insipid uh, sculpt, uh, sculpture, I was continuing to write uh, poems with the middle section of the book, which we're calling Scree. And at the time I was writing really fast. Um, and this is because I was just extremely energized, uh, inspired, and was receiving a kind of a constant influx of new stimuli from, from Katie. Um, and because of the time difference, you know, um, I would wake up in the morning and and I would have like 40 new images um, and they would be, um, you know, snapshots from Katie's notebook with new ideas, or they would be, um, you know, photographs of, of work in progress. And then I would immediately respond. And uh, for, for the most of May, I wrote kind of like one poem a day. And sometimes I would write three um, in one sitting. And, um, and then I would immediately kind of send them back to Katie um, and, and um, you know, and then she would start responding to them again in turn. But because there was so much back and forth and so much immediate sharing, and then also so much immediate integration of my poems into new sculptural iterations, there was very, very little room for editing. Um, and so the poems kind of retain an extreme, like kind of a raw immediacy um, which is still, uh, you know, still create a continuity between the body of work uh, due to the kind of um, ongoing uh, persistent nature of, of the project and the energy with which that project is being created. Um, at this point, I was also coming to terms uh, with the unreadability um, of my poems. Um, in the sense, as you can see on the screen here, that they were being squashed, <laughs> folded, and, and differently manipulated, uh, right? And so of course they become, the poems become readable in a different way. Um, they, you know, they are now readable as they are part of this sculptural work, but they are less readable um, in terms of moving away from the, from, from the meaning they would have um, on the flat surface of the page and taking on the more spatial um, sculptural um, embodiment. But due to kind of moving away from the readability of, of um, the more print tradition of poetry was very freeing um, for me. So on the one hand, just kind of the speed of working, on the other hand, this kind of sense of like, maybe people won't even be reading this, you know? And so, um, and so you know, I, I had just had so much fun and freedom in, in, in my writing process. Also at this time, um, Katie and I were having a very active discussion about moving away from the linearity of my writing practice. By linearity, I mean using the poetic line um, as, as the medium of, of what, I, what I was working on, what, what I'm working with when I'm writing. Uh, Katie was really urging me to fill up the page more um, because just very practically, you know, if 
if the entire poem is writing down the left hand margin of a page um, and she's trying to shape that that page into a sculpture then she's working with the entire right hand page being blank which means that there's so much less ability to show the poem um, as as being part of the sculptural work and so I felt quite challenged by this um, and initially thought that it was impossible for me, me to do, but then pretty uh, soon realized that it was very possible and very fun and that now I no longer want to work with a poet line. Um, but so I, you'll, you'll see soon when, when, when Katie and I uh, share some of these free poems that I very much started experimenting with the page um, and moving away from the line from um, from and also realizing how hard it is to move away from the line just because of the way we we're we're um we're taught to read from you know from left to right on the page um but by moving away from the line as much as possible moving away from syntax and sentence and moving to a more fragmented experience of working with a word um and then the page and how those words are placed on the page so um, in the end, there were nine uh, scree poems after I, you know, culled a bunch. Um, and Katie and I are going to share um, a few of those with you now. Screen, scrim of the flat world, enigmatic, untransparent, yet. Opacity always seems to fluoresce in contradistinction to its lack of clarity. Porous landslide vibes, thin sheen perforates, illusion of depth surfaces. Layers, lay down, lay bare, lay waste, lay waiting, latency of the upward fall. Scansion of this poem is every slash as slope, slopping over the edges of its container. Velocity screens itself against the level endlessness, not stillness. Screen. I give up the enduring and stable support of the poetic line. It's long since even footing of meter dissipated sing into freefall. Words drop their stones, echoes, sounds. I'm still on the line, rhyme. Scree, no. Stones, rocks, boulders. Pebbles, gravel, gray feeling, great feeling, monumental, mountainous, scree, pip, kernel, seed, not, not, not negative space of air. Stones are not lines. Or are they veins, layers, seams of stones, of stories, underway, undergarment, slope, drop, shoulder emotion, stratum, undercurrent, poems, lines that line, lines that break, Fragment through accretion, screen, end, break, gap, space, crevice, cut, strata, strut, word, to write with the word, stones, words verbs, lithic affect. The long fundament of the poetic line inclines to its dissolution in propitious trust of the word governed.
by the in-between page of the loquacious. Screen. I project with my voice, with my vision, the loudness of this poem on the fragmentary voyage of this page of the sculpture, screen, screen of this us. Screen. Gentle page, thank you for harboring the page as poem, as word, as lengthening, scene. Gentle line, thank you for layering, for incision, lingual ease, scene. Gentle verb. Thank you for making the word a poem, for making the word poems. Screen, scree. So as Clara mentioned earlier, her process of moving away from the poetic line directly influenced my sculptures. In fact, it actually made me more aware of the poetic line um, and the, the way that words occupy the space of a page. This was really exciting for me as it made me think about how the poem has uh, its own sculptural qualities. Where the words could be clumped together or thrown out to occupy different uh, parts of the page. Uh, and in this manner, they, they can occupy both the physical and negative space. I think because of this, um, my works for the scree section of the book became more architectural in form and played more with the, uh, the page in its uh, traditional two-dimensional state as opposed to an insipid where it was completely three-dimensional. So there's three parts to the uh, scree section um, or uh, three sculptures. Uh, the first is concertina, which you can see here. Then there's um, a work called Cutouts, followed by Boulders. So in Scree Concertina, the sculptures play with these new and varied uh, structures of Clara's poems by folding parts of the poem uh, and my image uh, so that they are uh, hidden or pushed back or pushed forward uh, to create new compositions or um, configurations of the word and the image. So in the uh, next um, uh, work uh, for this uh, sculpture uh, in cutouts, um, here we are. <laughs> so in screen cutouts, um, again, I'm, I'm using the more traditional, when I say traditional, I mean a, a flat uh, two-dimensional page. Um, so as opposed to manipulating it into the three-dimensional. However, in this work, I've used um, the technique of cutouts, which is um, used to create pop-up books or uh, pop-up cards. Uh, and I'm going to just say I did do quite a bit of a, a bit of research on pop-ups uh, and some experimenting during the residency, but I am no expert at um, the creation of pop-up books. However, uh, even using the most basic um, cutout techniques, as you can see in this work. Um, has allowed me to isolate um, particular words and images um, and physically push them out of the page so that they weave in and out of one another and demand their own space. What I also really enjoyed about uh, working in this way was that um, it created um, a new negative space which um, behind the cutout which another image or, or poem could then occupy. So the final um, sculpture of this section of the book is uh, boulders, um, which you can see here. In this work, as you can see, I have returned to the uh, more three-dimensional form that you saw in Insipit. So uh, the, the paper poems and the images have been hand molded and, and scrunched again. 
However, this work um, has a weightiness that the others don't have. And that is because they've, um, they've been treated through the process of paper mache. So they, they now have transformed into objects that have the appearance of glazed ceramic, or they actually remind me a little of the, the surfaces of crustacean. But although um, this work has the appearance of being um, stronger or more permanent than the other works, once the individual pieces are balanced on top of one another, like you see here, they become a collection of fragments. Uh, so they return to this um, state of flux and fragility, again, um, as we saw in Insipid. They grow together like the um, mounds of a cairn, where they, they, um, they peak, they crash, they tumble, they grow again. And what I really loved was the idea of a book with um, an infinite loop of regeneration or reconfiguration. So now that you've experienced uh, sections of our artist's book, uh, we just want to take a step back and talk for a little while about the research that we were doing at our text. Because implicit uh, to the making of this work, Insipid, Scree, Explicit, is our intensive reading uh, of secondary texts um, about the artist book, and then also an exploration of an exploration through uh, tactility and intimacy of actual items um, of artist books that we were, you know, um, finding at, at the art, art text uh, archives. So one of our main first um, takeaways from our research was this realization that the artist book uh, is by definition breaking away from its contents-based definition. So that is the form, the shape, the container of the book uh, takes precedence over the words that it houses. The work as a book of art, uh, sorry, the book as a work of art um, is a bilingual edition in Italian and English uh, edited by Giorgio Maffei and Maura Piccio. And this was one of our favorite secondary sources um, at our text. And in it, Maffei writes, and I'm gonna quote a fairly lengthy uh, quote here. The progressive transformation of the book into a work of art, when it distances itself from structure and the original function allows an artist to use pages, which are no longer subject to the diktats of reading, as a figurative space and deploys art, which is a combination of signs which can document, or indeed be, a new aesthetic way of life. Without any literary support other than what they bring along themselves, the artist brings new baggage, widens their horizons, and uses the book as a place for research, end quote. So this quote really stood out to us um, because it so clearly emphasizes the page as the medium, as a material uh, for making something which is no longer directly uh, part of the book object tradition while still existing um, within the culture um, and tradition of the book. And so, the, the, we really like this idea of the book as a site for research, because on the one hand, it still um, points back to this idea of um, learning from reading, um, you know, from the, from the process of reading, but it also includes this more generative possibility of constant flux um, that thinking, uh, discovering, and researching uh, creates. So this is more generative sense that is a part of, of the book, the book tradition, which also, you know, includes making them. And this realization really compounded our desire to create our own sculpt sculptural uh, artist book. Um, so beyond our secondary reading, we were really uh, initially just looking very widely um, at the archive, the, the art text archives, and kind of just looking almost at random uh, through the, the e-catalog uh, online. And, you know, inputting keywords of artists and writers who we already, uh, you know, really already admired, and also just gravitating towards um, any kind of collaboration we could find between, um, you know, visual imagery and textual materials. So this was like, the, like the first, maybe the first week of our research. And then um, actually the two wonderful librarians, um, Hélène Brousseau and Jessica Hébert, 
pointed us in the direction of the Mobile uh, bookmobile collection, which is this massive collection of 12 huge boxes of which we only really looked at three um, of, of um, uh, zines, artist books, and all kinds of independent and experimental publishing um, that was actually traveling and being exhibited on like a kind of in a kind of a mobile sense uh, across North America between 2000 and 2005. Uh, there was just way too much stimulating material to even possibly start showing uh, you all of this. Um, and so um, I'm going to prompt Annabelle to add a couple of, of links to the chat because we made some videos of items that we really, really liked. Um, but weren't able to share it with you today. So we will, you know, if you follow these links, you can go look at them um, at your own time. But just to say that, you know, our research really ranged from the kind of more traditional um, home image side by side, um, and then kind of experiments with um, the book form. Um, so kind of maintaining the codex kind of pageability um, of the book object while still, while also um, playing with texture, playing with cutouts, playing with, with different appendages and so on, all, uh, added to the book to kind of make it um, a more, a more um, experimental um, project. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we were also really gravitating towards actual sculptural uh, artist books that were really, you know, trying to, um, to move away from what you would expect when, when you think of, of the book in, in, in the 21st century. So we are going to share one video um, with you, uh, which is a work that is also part of the, the Moby Leave uh, collection. And it's by an artist whose name is uh, Ayn Scannell. And the work is called Journey Out of Kosovo 1999. Um, I just want to also just say that it, it does include some sensitive content, and so, but our our reason for showing it to you is um, because it is the most sculptural work that we were able to find um, um, at our text. So as Clara mentioned, what we really loved about this work is this sculptural uh, form. 
here the words and the, the pages have been used as the actual material for the, uh, for the sculpture and um, transformed from the two dimensional into the three dimensional through a very physical process of paper mache. Because of this, um, the transformation, um, or because of this, it transforms the way that the reader, the viewer then interacts, handles and explores the work. And there's no, um, there's not really a clear beginning, middle or end to this, this work. What we also really loved um, was the tactility of it um, and how significant that was also in affecting um, the experience of the reader. So there's a lot of, I mean, as you can maybe see uh, through the video, but there's a lot of uh, anticipation that does come from opening the box, discovering the items, handling the shoes, unraveling the, um, the scroll that um, makes it the, the act of, uh, of this discovery um, something incredibly precious and intimate. And this intimacy is also exaggerated by the evidence of the hand of the maker on the surface of the, of the items. Um, and also um, gives a real strong sense of uh, time, place and uh, memory. We also hope that this video kind of gave a sense of how I was able to touch the items in, in the archive. Um, because throughout our research, we were really struck by the privilege of being able to physically handle um, a lot of the quite delicate items um, in the archive. And I've done some research at other archives and usually the items are either distanced um, behind you know, a plexiglass uh, partition or they're digitized so that you don't get to touch them at all. Um, or at best, maybe you can you know, uh, handle them with a pair of white gloves. But at our text, uh, the, the practical use value um, of the book object is centralized. And this tradition allows us or allows me uh, to experience some very delicate works through the tactility of handling them, um, paging through them, feeling them, uh, their textures and manipulating their, their folds and appendages. So now, of course, <laughs> due to the virtual nature of our collaboration, uh, I never actually got to experience any of the archive with my own uh, hands and uh, eyes and instead relied solely on the hands and eyes of Clara, but also um, on my new mechanical body, which took the form of Clara's phone attached to a tripod with FaceTime running. And also uh, we had a uh, Zoom uh, on our laptops just so that we could speak uh, face to face while we were looking at the works. So as such, my, as I said, my hands, they uh, never got to physically turn the pages or uh, explore the different folds and forms and surfaces um, of all these uh, beautiful um, items. Um, and this um, really did affect the, my experience of, um, of, my, of the research and, and, and the archives at Artext. So I, I spent my time watching Clara um, or Clara's hands a little bit like you have just in this video, um, going through the mobile livre, um, selecting, uh, witnessing her select works, also uh, witnessing her um, uh, go past go past works. Oh, and carefully opening and um, turning and touching the pages. And all of this felt like quite an intimate uh, experience and could have felt intrusive um, on my part. And sometimes it did feel like I was viewer to a performer or a performance, but most of the time it actually felt like I was the performer herself. So uh, looking at these items through Clara's perspective, seeing her hands and my hands um, merge for those moments. It was a very unique um, experience of, of the archives. I would like to say it also gave me a really strong urge to make something physical with my own hands. <laughs> so something that I could uh, touch, uh, feel, and that Clara would experience uh, through me. Um, and in this way, the, the book was um, also a place where our collaborative process uh, grew, this, um, this sharing of experience and, and, and back and forth. So technically our artist book is not quite finished yet. Um, I have written uh, a set of 10 uh, explicit poems um, and Katie still has to complete uh, the final explicit <laughs> sculpture. Um, 
And while I was, but while I was writing uh, these final poems, I was really wondering how I could simultaneously bring this book to a close while also kind of opening up a new section and, and you know, expanding um, into, this, into this new work, this new final work. And so what I ended up doing was this kind of a strategy of going back and looking really, really closely at the photo documentation that Katie had been sending me and looking for traces of words of my previous poems that I could find in those images, you know, and sometimes it would only be a, a glimpse, like for example, in this image right in front of us, you know, I can see a gentle verb. And then going into the new poems and, and quoting uh, myself. Um, so kind of creating these kind of citational moments from earlier poems um, in the, the newer, the, the new set of poems. So those was, this was the one, the one method I was following of, um, of both kind of leaning back and looking forward. And my other main strategy was to actually uh, physically try and represent what a sculpture looked like uh, on the page. So to kind of mimic the, the shapes of, of Katie's work um, on, on, on the, you know, through words on the poetic, on the poetic page. So Katie and I are gonna uh, share a handful um, of these, these final explicit poems uh, with you. Explicit. The sculpture fans out, shoulders broad for the final fold. Language refracted, fragmentary, project of this poem. Words borrowed from previous verse, rehearsed. With voice, voyage, vision, voluptuous crease, gentle verb. This sculpture is a cycle of poems. This poem is a set of sculptures. Styled with the irreverent physicality that rhymes with scriptures. Explicit. The loudness of this page enunciates itself firmly. Sculptural text box of the glimpse. Facets, liniments, fault lines, enjambments running along eternal fragmentation. Fierce poem of my voice articulates itself, firstly, along the shapely, shapely visionary. Facts, lines, foul language, end in part way, but continuing in decomposition. Gentle page of this poem silences itself faintly, flimsy body leaking stability. Faces, lines, faults run on. Sentences forgetting their syntactical twists. Lines forging their syntactical creases. Crumpling, poised as poises. Explicit. The stone opens its surface to the world or crumples reverse to its core. Puckered rock in the prime of prehistoric self, crush. Crumpled orifice outcrop unrolling the circular in inlet of the intimate. Ceramic scree hardens in vision, in lithic relation to its own disambiguation, both stone-like and lithe. Explicit, public worship leaves no room for doubt. Explicit, even graphic space, spatial mistrust, the angular is not enclosure, but the scope to roam in two directions at once, cornered and correlating with outstretched sleeves. Explicit. Visual balancing, delicate balancing, visionary balancing, belligerent balancing, 
viscous balancing, crystal balancing, velocity balancing, opaque balancing, vigorous balancing, collapsing balancing, vigilant balancing, lapsed balancing, visceral balancing, virtual balancing. Explicit. The sculpture articulates itself through slippage, spillage of words, not unraveling, but marveling at the scene, at the scene. Here, sets of words. Undercurrent becomes undergarment. Fragment becomes fragrant. Kernel becomes carnal and mesmerizing acts of reading flutter at the sight, at every definition of explicit, come undone, soft voyeuristic reversal of meaning, unveiling being in vain. The sculpture explicates, extricates itself from the loosening, not loss of language. So as Clara mentioned, um, the explicit uh, sculpture part of this project is not complete. So that is a work in progress that I will continue to uh, develop uh, over the next month. But we thought it would be nice to share a few images of where we are with the work um, and uh, what direction I'm thinking of, of taking with it. So one of the things um, I really loved about Clara's um, set of explicit poems is that they do uh, loop back on themselves. Um, there's a sort of self-examination of the book as a whole. So picking out words that she's now uh, that she can see in their new uh, configurations or their new transformations as, as sculpture was something that really appealed to me and made me think. Um, about the actual uh, idea of an artist's book, which is often described as being about itself. So it's, it's a book that is uh, self-referential. So in this work, you can see um, perhaps, I have returned to uh, the forms that uh, I used in Insipid. Uh, these kind of references to grammatical uh, uh, language, the, the shapes of the, the brackets and, and the colons and the commas. But I've also um, developed or am developing um, the use of paper mache like I did in the Scree Boulders uh, sculpture. But the difference uh, with this work is that um, the poems and the images have been um, manipulated before they've been uh, transformed into a three dimensional state. So I've actually been uh, coating the papers with oil, uh, which has made them um, transparent, but also gives them a, a strange consistency or structure not dissimilar to a lasagna sheet. <laughs> so the, the paper sort of transforms into this uh, pasta paper um, and, and becomes um, an object that's quite immalleable. Um, that is until I have uh, put it back through uh, the paper mache process, which does then allow me to um, hand mold and uh, sculpt uh, the, the paper poems and, and the um, or the, the new lasagna uh, poems and uh, images. And the other thing that I was thinking about um, or I'm thinking is the term explicit. So not just in the sense of a bookend and a balance of insipid um, explicit uh, or the end of the collaboration or the, you know, this kind of um, conclusion but also um, it's more bodily sensual meaning um, for explicit. So here um, I'm thinking about the material as being more skin-like, um, the folds uh, having more tactility or sensualness um, about them, and also um, the colors uh, and, and the transparency reference um, the skin. 
this is where I am <laughs> with the work. So I, I'm still at a very early uh, stage. And this is just an example um, here. There, there are four uh, sculptures that I've made so far. However, Clara has written <laughs> 10 poems <laughs> and it's very difficult for me to choose out of out of them so i do imagine that um there will be 10 uh, sculptures for each one of those poems and um they will come together or, or be composed or configured in a way um where the the text uh, or the image um shine through one another or or, or expose one another um, with this new uh, translucent um, paper. So yeah, so that's that's where I am uh, just now, and I, I'm not sure where it will go, but I'm sure we will find that out uh, soon. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think both Katie and I have lots more to say. In fact, our, our first version of this talk was like two hours long. <laughs> and I even realized that like this one has gone longer than we expected. Um, but it's just been extremely inspiring uh, working together since the beginning of May, um, well, working virtually together since the beginning of May um, at Artex. And so we just wanna take a moment also just to thank uh, the Artex staff who have been extremely supportive, enthusiastic, and just really willing to accommodate our needs, um, including opening at different hours so that we could um, you know, accommodate the time difference that Katie and I are, are working with. Uh, so in particular, uh, we'd like to thank Sarah Watson, uh, Mojan Bezadi, Annabelle Chassé, Hélène Brousseau, Jessica Hébert, and also previous st uh, staff members, Joanna Joachim and Patricia Bushel, uh, for initial support in 2019. So we now have quite a substantial uh, body of work that exceeds any um, any idea of what we, we would have produced at the start of the residency. We now have this, uh, this book, a collection of, of sculptures, sets of poems, a video and a photo documentation um, that we do want to exhibit as an in-person exhibition. Um, hopefully when COVID-19 lets us uh, travel again and, and do that. But we are being optimistic that that may happen in, in uh, 2022 or hopefully not too long after that. And I think um, one of the things that's just um, really struck us about this residency is just the ease at which Clara and I work together. And it's just been a pleasure to, um, to have this time to, uh, to do that. And um, and when I and, and I've been saying to um, a lot of friends and, and colleagues throughout this that it's just been so easy, and I don't mean I mean easy in a very uh, positive way, and it it's been so productive, and, and I do have a feeling that a little like the infiniteness of the um, the poems and the sculptures, I, this won't be the end of our collaboration together. <laughs> So I'm going to read the final poem um, of this project just to kind of bracket and conclude um, our presentation. Explicit. Closing the words, unlike a door, they don't hinge, but follow the oracular medium of folds, shut. Creases embellish their holding, one hand held up, the other gesture posed. This landing page of endings regressing into strokes, unfurling meaning and the culminating shout out, cut, ritualistic roll call of poems. Some forms open, others closed. No pause till now, the lyrical proposes a progression from beginning to middle to eye, out. Vowel steps into vow of own openness, in excess, in excelsis. Accessing the grand finale, we disentangle our roles to compare insipid. Here ends, the scroll is unrolled. Thank you. <laughs> So I guess at this point, if anyone uh, has any more um, stamina, we would we will take questions.
Uh, yes, so Annabelle, ha thank you so much, Claire and Katie. That was so gorgeous. And uh, to see the work that you've been doing and the result is just really profoundly beautiful. Annabelle has been uh, gathering some questions from the audience throughout the um, event. Uh, I think you have a couple, Annabelle. And if you have other ones that you would like her to, to give to uh, Claire and Katie, you can do so, or you could just kind of uh, say that you would like to ask it yourself in the chat and we'll go in order. Yes, so uh, I received a question of uh, Margarita for uh, both of you, uh, Clara and Katie. So the question is, Will this project result in a publication or do you see that as being antithetical to the initial goal of the project where you sought to expand the definition of a book? Okay, yeah. do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, this is a conversation that we had actually <laughs> have had many times, uh, particularly at the start of the project. But I think as the as the work has become more um, of an artwork, it, I think we it, we are seeing that it it will um, exist as a one off artwork. Um, however, the the poems um, and the documentation of the artworks um, we will be um, collating into um, a two dimensional. <laughs> um, publication or, or print. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think when we when we started the residency, we were leaning towards a digital uh, version of this project. You know, we were initially kind of thinking we would do something online. Um, and then very quickly it became this extremely sculptural work. And I think even in one of our first meetings, I was like naively asking whether you could make like a print run of, you know, 10 or yeah. <laughs> just like wondering like how many of these like scrunched up, you know, <laughs> configurations would you make? And maybe we'd have a set of 10, you know, we could like give them to a few people. But I think, I think it's like very much like the sculptural works are very much unique works and are just um, not reproducible. Um, but as Katie was saying, we are thinking of having a stack of the, the printed out poems, as well as maybe photographs of all the different poses of, for example, the insipid sculpture um, available so that if we were to have an exhibition, those, those like a little stack, we keep calling it a stack, a little stack of, um, of, uh, of those poems would be available to, to page through to read. Um, and I mean, we're not we're not closing ourselves off to whatever happens in the future. I think, you know, if if there's if there's opportunity to create a different version of the work um, that's that's more printable, I think you know I would I would personally be open to that. But it wouldn't be the same work as the sculptural version of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also another thing we were talking about it was maybe um, creating some kind of audio version um, to. And these are all ways of trying to like impl <laughs> to return the text into the sculpture without, you know, uh, because of the, un the unreadability of it, right? So if there's some kind of audio recording that's like, um, that goes alongside uh, the, the um, unreadable sculptures, that would be a different way of, of, um, of, formulating, of formulating the text. Um, yeah. The very short answer is that for us, the sculptures are the book despite them not looking like a book in a traditional form. Um, if there are other questions, um, please feel free to uh, take, take um, the airspace and, and uh, do so spontaneously. I have a question for Katie, if that's allowed. Of course. <laughs> um, every time that we talk about this work, we kind of skim over, the, like I, I, I notice something you say and then we skim over it and then I never get to ask you about it again. Um, and I, I'm really curious, you, 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 you talk about the sculptural aspect of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to hear a bit more about what you mean by that, because it's just such an evocative like. <laughs> I can see negative and positive space in everything. So that's, and for me, I mean, 
Um, I, 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 my background is in sculpture. I, I did my BA and my, and my master's in sculpture and we're very, it was a, a, quite a traditionally taught a uh, program uh, which always um, it goes on about how the object occupies not just uh, the, the space of itself but also the space around it and how that affects uh, the way that the viewer uh, then reads or interacts with the work. So when I'm looking at your poems that you've um, where you've reconfigured the words into these um, new uh, kind of stanzas or um, groupings I see them as I see those words as, as sculptures in themselves where they're they're playing um, with the space that's that, that they don't just take up but also the, the space that's created around them and for me like I said that that was a really uh, exciting because I've never um, I've never considered the two-dimensional page already having a three-dimensional properties that I can play with I, it's it's always been after I've manipulated it into a, um, a, a physical or th a three-dimensional state that I that I explore those and mm -hmm. um, so yeah it, it, I think that, that that is something that will stick with me actually and I don't know if that answers uh, no, totally. yeah. you know, so the page becomes spatial already <laughs> like even yeah. There, there's a question in the chat. Um, someone is asking, how do you think uh, the experience would have been different if you, Katie, could have physically been in the room with Clara? I don't think we would have produced as much, actually. <laughs> I said this to Clara recently and I said, it would have been an amazing, uh, you know, and, and, and a very different experience. Um, and I would have loved to have been there and to have had the extra time to just have open discussions that you do when you're walking to the archives or where you're having dinner together or, or coffee. But it did make us really focused. Like we knew we didn't like, we were working against time differences, like a five hour time difference. And we knew we only had this short, um, uh, residency together so I think it really did make us um, far more uh, productive and focused than we might have been and um, I think also the fact that we were working uh, mainly based in our own places like I'm in London when I do a residency elsewhere it takes me a little while to settle in and um, I you know and explore the area and you know that would have been lovely but um I think because I didn't have that settle in period, I, I also it was we started working. Um, in fact, we started working before the residency even began. <laughs> so, yeah, I I think in short, we were more productive this way, but um, it would have been um, really special to have had that physical time together and for me to have been physically in the archives of Artex because it's been like a teaser for me. Um, I have so wanted to hold those items and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I'm, I'm still fingers crossed that next year I will be able to make it and experience that myself, but here's hoping. Yeah. Yeah. It was really funny because um, when, you know, for our, our residency would have been last year um, and then due to COVID it was, it was postponed. And so earlier, I can't remember if it was early, uh, late last, I'm mean, probably early this year we, Katie and I met with Mojan and before we met with Mojan over Zoom, Katie and I were like, we're not going to do this virtually, we're not going to do this virtually. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we, we, we spoke to Mojan for five minutes and we were like, okay, we're going to do this virtually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the first selling point, you know, was the sense of like not having to wait another year and, you know, and I think then partially, um, um, you know, the, the, the extreme productivity that we've had over the past six weeks was maybe like a, a way of overcompensating in, in too, you know, because we, 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 we knew that like a lot of odds were against us, you know, we are far apart, we have, um, we have a time difference, um, you know, Katie is, is only able to access everything through me um, and through the photographs that I send her or through the videos or whatever. And so we had this sense that we really had to make this work. And I think, I mean, I think we did, <laughs> um, but, it, it is a, it's, I mean, it's, it's very speculative to wonder like what would we have done if it was, if it was in person, but it would definitely have been, you know, this is reductive to say, but it would have been different. And um, there's a good chance that we would have produced less. And I think, and I think, you know, chances would have been that 
my kitchen would have become a studio <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> And I like what you say about this, like, desire, like on your end, Katie, this like de profound desire to have, act, to, to be touching, um, maybe made you, and you did mention that, that it made you uh, want to, to create a material. Yeah, I mean, or, I really had no idea. I, I, I honestly thought that we would produce something virtual. I mean, that was, you know, in mm -hmm. the early stages of the conversation was that we didn't think that it would be enough time to create anything physical. But I mean, we, we, we proved against that. So I think, and it really was the, certainly on my part, a really like desperation to physically <laughs> touch something. <laughs> it's a, yeah, this, this last world, you know, the world for us at the moment, via Zoom, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's an, a really interesting experiment or a result of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have another question. Uh, did you vary the type of paper that you printed the poems on? Yes, yes, yes. So I um, I used mainly a fine art G clay paper. So it's like um, the texture of a watercolor. So it really, I could go on about ages for this. So I won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really, uh, depending on the, the weight and the texture of the paper really affects the structure that it has and how I can mold that and manipulate it into the three-dimensional shape. So it's a mixture of um, smooth matte papers, varying and, and very textured like watercolor papers varying from maybe 80 GSM to like 360. So it's, it's, it is a, a, a big uh, difference depending on, on the works. And, and also the ones for Boulder, the reason they have this more uh, ceramic-like uh, surface is because they're printed on a very glossy surfaced uh, photo paper. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, for the final explicit one, which I haven't shown you yet, I am also experimenting with Kozo paper, which is very, very fine, um, maybe like 40 GSM and yeah, like tissue, you know, like a tissue. Um, but yeah, so that's, yeah. <laughs> wow. I think it, it'll be so interesting for this work to be, uh, would you accept like the people touch it if, if it were to be? We presented yeah. yeah we hope so yeah, we <laughs> hope so. yeah I mean that's the other thing that I was really interested in personally was that for me you know um with a sculptural background when you make a sculpture especially um when you when you use a um, paper which is very fragile it's really not uh, encouraged for the viewer to touch it <laughs> especially in a gallery context um, <laughs> I, I have, I, I do make uh, paper sculptures myself, so I, I have had many instances where, you know, the, the curator or the gallerist has been very, you know, we've, we've had to be very careful about that. So that's what I really loved about moving it into the book format or the artist mm -hmm. format, because it, it really it takes that away and it brings the viewer or the reader um, closer to the work uh, and, and makes it more of an, an intimate experience. So yeah, that really excited me, that, that difference. <laughs> Yeah, I love because you were you were telling me before that a certain gallerist told you that you had to make your sculptures sturdier. You know that they were yeah. they were falling over or something. Well, um, they were. <laughs> but but I feel like with this project, you've just like instead of making them sturdier, you've embraced that. And you know, like they are supposed to fall apart. <laughs> like, yeah, all, they can, and in this context, they can. I mean, yeah, it's. Uh, Certainly, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about, you know, you, you have to, it, it depends where they're shown, doesn't it? Like if you if you have a space where you've got a huge footfall, you can't expect somebody to keep rebuilding your sculpture for you, you know, or you can't be there 24 hours to, to do it. So yeah, it's it's been very freeing um making it in the in this book format because it it is allowed to, it, it can collapse. And, and also the viewer is encouraged to rebuild it when it does. So, you know, maybe that's something I should do with my sculpture. <laughs> Encourage the viewers to rebuild it for me. <laughs> that's great. I would love to try myself. <laughs> so would I. I. I mean, I haven't seen this work in person either, so. Yeah, it must for you too, Clara. You so this the roles were reversed in this uh, 
process. Yeah. <laughs> so now you have no idea what it's been like to to touch those. Uh... The the insipid sculpture, uh, the insipid video, the first video clip that we showed you. There's a longer version, right? And it's it's on Vimeo, and you can go watch on your own. But um, when Katie sent it to me the first time, I was absolutely enthralled, you know. And it's like ten minutes long or something, but I just couldn't stop watching it because it was like the most physical iteration that I'd had or like experience I'd have of, had of this work that I had been working on, uh, so to say, but um, I'd only seen them in flat images. And so suddenly seeing it in like a moving way, like you could like watch, you know, um, surround, whatever. <laughs> seeing it move was, was um, seeing it move 